Welcome, Hannah. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. This is like a really big and important topic. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad to sneak in before before this all finishes up. It's great to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be good. Um, so your working cognition is incredibly relevant to the theme of well-being that we're discussing today. Uh, can just to start with, can you tell us a little more about your role at UniSA? Oh, and maybe I could provide a bit of a definition about cognition if we're going to be talking yes, about it today. Absolutely. Uh, and really we're talking about thinking skills. So your ability to, to remember things, to pay attention to things. We use our cognitive processes all day long. Um, and my role uh, at UniSA is an associate professor of psychology and I hold a fellowship at the moment. So I'm mainly... Um, doing research about, about cognitive aging and dementia, very luckily. Um, I love what you said that it was like thinking skills. And I feel like everybody kind of has a time when they recognize that's important, but how did your interest come about so that you turned it into your career? Yeah, so I think even in high school, I was really interested in psychology and not just psychology, but uh, the biological uh, end of psychology. And I think why cognition, I think just cognition is so important for us, you know, and, and it's so related to our quality of life and our um, ability to undertake activities of daily living. And, um, you know, I think we're all biased as researchers, but I think definitely <laughs> think <laughs> cognition is the most interesting. <laughs> and, and what are you currently focusing on within that co cognition sphere? Yeah, so we're mainly interested in how we can prevent people uh, from declining co their cognition. So how can we prevent cognitive decline in late life? And how can we prevent dementia, which is a severe form of cognitive impairment? Yeah, that's interesting. such an important area of research. Uh, but what's been the most challenging aspect of that research? It, it feels like it's it could be so heavy, you know, emotionally and, and psychologically as well for you. I, I mean, there are so many challenges, uh, but sometimes challenges are the most interesting things in, in our research career because it's very satisfying uh, once you've, you've, you've accomplished something. As in terms of dementia prevention, I suppose the challenging thing is identifying how can we prevent dementia? Uh, what are the risk factors? And this is certainly not myself and certainly not one person around the world, but globally, there's been a huge effort in the last decade to consolidate and synthesize those risk factors. And, in, and now we think about 40% of dementia cases worldwide are completely preventable. Wow. Wow. So this focus on prevention as opposed to um, treatment, I guess, is something we've heard of quite a little bit recently in some of the other discussions that we've had with some of our other guests. Can you tell us maybe why we're only starting to look at prevention or has this been something we've been looking at for a while? Yeah, look, I, there's def there were definitely researchers for many decades saying that dementia is, is partly preventable, but it's really only gained momentum in the last sort of decade or so. Um, and I think uh, for many people, and, and, and certainly when we, um, tr we do a lot of community surveys and some people think dementia is an inevitable part of aging, but it's, it is not an inevitable part of aging. And I think that's starting to trickle, uh, certainly in the research community now, but also in, in, um, in broader society that we can actually proactively do things across our entire life. So from birth, birth to death, that can actually change the risk of our um, you know, our dementia risk. Wow, and are those biological things or environmental things that come into the prevention? So when we talk about prevention, we're really talking about modifiable risk factors. So they're not genetic because we, um, you know, we can we can somewhat change the, you know, our epigenetics, but we can't change our actual genetics. So uh, we're talking about things like early life education is very protective and can decrease our risk of dementia, but there's all sorts of things. So uh, having diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, being in polluted uh, air environments. So air pollution is actually a risk factor for dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, there's about 12 uh, recognised dementia risk factors, which are modifiable. Wow, that sounds like an awful lot. And so that's, um, that interplay must be really um, challenging, as we've said in the previous question. But what has been 
most interesting to you? Yeah. I mean, I think um, I, I, I the whole area is fascinating, obviously, for me. I think the links between early life and late life are particularly interesting. I think it's fascinating that the education, the formal education we do as children actually changes how we, um, you know, cognitively, de cognitively decline, you know, eight decades later. So for every one year of formal education we complete, we're at about 11% um, decreased risk of dying with a clinical diagnosis of dementia. So that, that's big impacts and it's impacts that are seen so many decades after, after we engage with that activity. Wow. Which is, yeah, it's a little bit terrifying to think of because, yeah, like you said, the perception and definitely when I was younger, my perception was that dementia is a factor of just aging. You know, it didn't it didn't feel preventative. It just kind of felt like inevitable for some people and and devastating as well. So what in, in regards to that um, perception and misconception, what are some ways we might be able to, to alter that in the general public? So we're actually doing some research right now on that. Uh, we have run one research project looking at how people, if people are actually identifying these risk factors accurately or not. But now we're looking at factors that might um, uh, relate to people's risk perception. So we know that people who have, um, who have had a relative who've, who's had a diagnosis of dementia, so are more likely to think they'll develop dementia themselves. But that's prob that may not be an accurate perception. Uh, we also are wondering if people with these risk factors are actually judging their risk to be to be less. So we're interested in though if those with hypertension are actually um, have a lower risk perception of that that risk factor. And we're also trying to understand actually what the community understands about about dementia risk factors. So I think there's a lot of public health campaigns that could be formulated. Uh, we just won't see the effects for many decades. But I don't think this is hugely dissimilar to, you know, I think we've all been, uh, have slip, slop, slack in our, in our brains from, from the 80s. And, oh, yeah. um, and so much around uh, smoking cessation and the strategies that are being used there with public health. And I think a lot of those um, strategies could actually be employed when we're looking at dementia prevention. We've also so run a... Sorry, we're sorry. No, continue on. I was going to ask a question about that, but continue on. A research project with um, Dr. Ash Smith and Dr. Tobias Loescher and Dr. Mel Hull, where we've actually gone into primary schools and tried to educate primary school children not only to develop to reduce their risk of dementia, even as ten-year-olds, but also just to improve or decrease stigma around dementia and aging in in younger children. Yeah, well, I was going to ask about that with the children and trying to educate the children. Do you run into any specific challenges if you're trying to educate children as opposed to adults? Look, I think sometimes you have to use, you certainly use different language with the children. But uh, look, the children we've worked with so far are so open-minded. And what we did see is that they did increase their knowledge of dementia. So they started to understand more so what dementia was and what the risk factors for dementia were. And also how to interact with people with dementia, some strategies to use in residential aged care uh, and other settings. Uh, so we saw actually increases in the dementia knowledge and um, decreases in the stigma. That's really, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it is a, it is a terrifying thing. I always remember growing up and my parents, because my great grandmother had had dementia, and my parents being so terrified of getting it, and there would be that thing of like, oh, that's going to be terrible. Just you know, put me out of my misery, blah blah blah. But it was just like, well, these people are people, it, you know. Like, there's it, just because you're getting dementia doesn't make you any less human and worthy of of being around. Absolutely, and I think. Um... I hope that stigma around dementia is decreasing. Uh, as we all grow older, um, I think, uh, you know, hopefully the stigma around dementia and other age-related conditions uh, decrease. Um, just jumping back to what you were saying before in terms of your interest, you said that you had um, more of an interest on the biological side of, psych of psychology. Can you explain a little bit more about what that might mean? Yeah, well, I, I suppose as a teenager, I was just fascinated by how something in in, in your skull is dictating or uh, what you're, you're what you're doing, how you see the world, 
um, and how you're thinking, how you're thinking about the future, how you think about the past. Um, and throughout my career, I've, I've always captured behavior, which is what psychologists capture behavior and including, you know, cognitive um, performance, but also concurrently the measured brain structure or brain function. And that's our, in, our, in the Kane lab, we mainly measure um, brain function through um, like electrical brain activity called through a process called EEG, um, but also we've used um, MRI. So looking at um, inside the head, but also over my postdoctoral period. So after the PhD, I got to work with autopsy samples. So people had actually donated their brain after they died and linking what we saw pathologically in the brain after death with the clinical symptoms during life. And that's so fascinating. It's such a privilege to work with those sort of um, samples and to think that their every being, their every memory, their every experience was, you know, in this, in this, um, you know, mass that we call the brain. That's amazing. So going forward, when you're looking at um, trying to uh, implement this knowledge into trying to help dementia patients, um, how, how is that different? How does that help you having those brain samples? Well, I spoke when in that, those particular studies, what we were looking is actually um, what is the neuropathology underlying dementia? I know sometimes we, uh, yeah, people think we know this, but actually there are so many unknowns about um, actually the pathological basis of dementia. So what's actually happening in the brain that, um, that leads to dementia? And I got to do um, a study that really leads into this prevention of dementia, where we looked at um, the pathology and if someone had actually died with clinical dementia and also um, the years of education they'd done as children. So what we found is that two people can die with the same pathology, so the same pathological load, um, and one could die with very severe dementia and one could never express any dementia symptoms during life. And looking at how people are actually able to compensate for that pathology um, you know, with various strategies that education seems to afford. Wow. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's just this whole thing of like, we, we know so little about the brain, so little. So you can diagnose these, these things, but yeah, the, the causation is so interesting. Have you discovered any, like in terms of prevention, are there any key things that people could do like now, or is that still in progress as part of the research? But absolutely there are things. So for those in early life, um, well, I say the first thing we can all do is educate ourselves and start to talk with our friends and family about these factors to start to spread this very um, robust evidence. Um, I think that, you know, there needs to be a bit of a grassroots public health campaign. But those in early life, definitely education has been shown to be protective, so uh, associated with a decreased dementia risk. In midlife, we're looking at things like hearing loss. So some people are surprised by that. Why would hearing loss be associated with dementia in, in late life? But it's actually because we've, well, there are many hypotheses, but a likely one is that actually, if we have a hearing impairment, we start to isolate ourselves and not involve ourselves in, in things, social things, um, any sort of group environment, because it's quite hard. So if you're having, having a hearing impairment, do get a hearing aid and ensure that you have, um, uh, you know, no impairment, just like, you know, I wear glasses. If you have a hearing impairment, do wear a hearing aid. Uh, traumatic brain injury, so avoiding too many knocks to the head, some, uh, un you know, an accident, but uh, certainly uh, trying to avoid any traumatic brain injury is, is important when we're talking about dementia prevention. Hypertension, so no, if you do have high blood pressure and ensure that it's not high, that's actually a huge one in a, a trial that was um, published nearly two years ago now, oh showed that people who actually had treatment for hypertension had a decreased incidence. So they had a less, less likelihood of developing cognitive impairments, including dementia. Uh, alcohol, don't, over, don't drink too much. That is a risk factor for dementia. Um, so um, light, light drinking. And obesity, particularly in midlife. So people um, who are obese in midlife are more likely to develop dementia in late life. Wow. 
I knew that we had, I mean, a lot of the discussions we've had have been talking a lot about mental health on how our brain affects our body, but I didn't realize there was so much we can do that affects our brain as well. Um, yes. On an individual level, then you've said um, a few things that we can do that might be preventative in ourselves, but what do you want people to take away from your research beyond just looking at practical examples of what we can impl um, employ in our lives? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I think um, that there are things we can do at any stage of our life to reduce our dementia risk would probably be a key key takeaway. And also that, you know, dementia isn't this scary, scary thing that we need to start more conversations about dementia, just like mental health more broadly. We need to take away the stigma to actually move forward and to, to take proactive approaches um, about prevention and, and, and other things. Yeah, I love that. And do you think this is what we need to be focus on, focusing on to improve our well-being, or is there something else we need to consider as well? Well, well I mean, well-being is is very big, big term. And and maybe if I narrow it down to um, like cognitive cognitive health, um, perhaps the key thing as well is to know that yes, cognition does decline as we age, but that actually um, it, we see different patterns for different cognitive skills or thinking skills. So some people get a bit worried about um, if, they, if they sort of self-reflect and they, they judge their cognitive skills or cognitive performance to be poorer than it was before. That's it's actually not, not usually nothing to be worried about. And maybe a key thing to know is that from about the 20s, we actually decline in things that um, we're required to um, process quickly. So we actually do have slower processing speed as we, as we age from the 20s and also some planning and reasoning tasks we actually decline on. But actually there are cognitive skills that we actually get better at. And we, the, an average 60 year old will actually outperform an average 20 year old. And those things are um, vocabulary knowledge, especially. So our knowledge about words and their meanings and when we see declines in vocabulary knowledge, it's only really after the 60s. So um, cognitive skills or cognitive performance, there's lots of, lots of um, different patterns we see in different domains. And, um, you know, people worrying too much about declines, you know, that you can go and see your GP, but also uh, sometimes it's just okay. So if it's a difference in how we perceive ourselves sometimes, if we think, oh, uh, my memory's gone down in whichever function, how, as a scientist, do you assess those things? Yeah, that's a good question. So we do actually capture sometimes um, subjective cognitive impairment. So someone's self-assessment of their, their thinking skills. And then we take, take, take a whole host of what we call objective cognitive um, measures. So when we might use paper and pencil, but also increasingly we're using computers and tablets to, to run these tasks. So there's actually, it's not um, a perfect overlap, actually, if we look at subjective cogn cognitive assessments and objective, uh, each is probably telling us a, a bit of a different, different story. That's very interesting. And that's quite a good uh, lead on. We had a question in the chat saying, do those brain training games work? Yeah. That's a really good question. Cognitive engagement definitely has shown to reduce dementia risk, but it doesn't have to be a brain training um, program. Anything that you will engage with frequently and enjoy is the ideal cognitive, um, cognitive stimulation. Uh, so that might be a cognitive training platform, uh, or it might be... Uh, you know, Sudoku or crosswords or logging onto Coursera and listening to a few different lectures. Anything that um, you're cognitively challenged is a good thing for, for your dementia, to reduce your dementia risk. Does that include both like creative pursuits as well as logical pursuits? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. There has, hasn't been as much research, but yes, um, especially in late life, some of those creative pursuits seem to be quite, quite important. Wow, I feel like I've learned a lot, which is good good for my brain, apparently. Yeah. Um, now, what about if you're talking about um, pursuits that people are engaging in to try and um, keep keep their brain activity up? Is there a certain age where people need to start doing that from, or is it like a full life thing? 
really is full life. So um, essentially we have our whole life to determine our dementia risk and, you know, we can have good behaviours such as engaging cognitively, but also socially. Social engagement is hugely important, you know, and, you know, there might, we might have some bad behaviours that essentially decrease our dementia risk, like, you know, smoking or too much, too much, you know, alcohol. I suppose one important caveat is that, um, you know, risk is not destiny. So we all know people who, um, you know, have smoked a pack a day for decades and have never had lung cancer and all people who have led extremely healthy lives and unfortunately have had cancer, you know, in their 20s. And so we're talking about risk, but risk mm -hmm. is certainly not, not destiny. Yeah, absolutely. And can you tell me a little bit more about the social impacts? Why we need those kind of social stimuli? Stimulus? Well, like the stimuli. social engagement aspect. Yeah. yeah that's, it seems really important, especially in late life. And that might just be because people are usually socially engaging in their sort of early and midlife. But maintaining social engagement is a really key to dementia prevention um, in late life. And that I think we all feel good when we're connected. And I think there's a lot of well-being science around um, uh, how positive social experiences can increase well-being and decrease depression symptoms. Um, also, social engagement usually involves cognitive engagement. So, you know, you might be talking about the latest, you know, things in the news. Um, you might be talking about current affairs or just it there's usually quite a bit of cognitive stimulation during any social engagement. And also um, sometimes you might be physically active during a social engagement. So you might um, go for a walk or do a class with a friend um, and do sort of physical activity and, and social engagement, which is um, two positive uh, activities in terms of dementia risk. So I, I don't know. Kind of, sorry. <laughs> Just, I've so got so many questions. I get <laughs> excited. <laughs> uh, with the current environment as well. So social interactions, does that include things like Zoom chats or, you know, even, you know, on your Facebook messenger or something like that when you can't actually get to that face to face kind of interaction? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And until this year, I don't think anyone had used Zoom and all these different platforms, FaceTime so much. So I think it will certainly be something that will be looked at in the future. I don't, couldn't tell you sort of the evidence base to it. I think, uh, you know, broader wellbeing science would say that there's a lot of um, positive things about these type of interactions and staying connected. Um, but also, so, you know, social media, perhaps uh, not so good on a like a, if it's too frequent in terms of uh but who knows well i suppose maybe as dementia prevention research will look at uh you know the impacts of this type of social engagement um in the future and speaking of the future for such a um a, a topic that covers such a long time if you're looking at someone's whole life how do you factor that into your research yeah, it's a really good question. And unfortunately, no grant body will fund us um, to do a study over the next 100 years from birth to death, and nor will I be alive to see the results. So we take different approaches. So um, we have a few studies that are sort of across a year, and we'll do a preventative action like a cognitive training um, uh, approach, or we will, um, you know, Say the dementia education program and see the effects in the short term but also there's opportunities to ask people about their previous experiences and I've had I've been lucky and have been involved in some what's called longitudinal studies where they follow people for decades um, and wow. captured data across the decades and they are um, amazing amazing studies to be a part of but of course the data that was collected 30 years ago was sort of dictated by the thing the thoughts at the of the time so essentially there's pros and cons of all the approaches and to come to you know the conclusions we have we have to blend all of these evidence bases yeah absolutely and um i guess the important thing for for people at the moment is is you know we've spoken so much about health and well-being and grounding yourself to to be have that positive outlook of like it doesn't matter when i start i can change my future you know you mm. might not necessarily if, if your destiny or whatever is, you know, if you end up getting dementia, it doesn't mean that 
you can't do things to to find that preventative measure as best you can in the meantime. So people don't have to give up now. <laughs> like, you know, Absolutely. oh, I've smoked a pack a day and I, I drink wine all the time, you know. So, yeah, so you're kind of giving people hope of like, oh, start now. It's okay. You've got this. <laughs> I absolutely agree. It's never too late to change your dementia risk. So you can never be too young or too old to make these proactive um, decisions about, you know, changing your lifestyle to reduce your dementia risk. It's a really good point. That's brilliant. And if people are interested in finding out more, where would you suggest we look? Where can we go? Yeah, so we do have a lab um, website, uh, kain.science, C-A-I-N.science. I think it might be provided, but, um, you know, just get in touch. Um, or we also have a Twitter account. We try to keep that pretty up to date. Awesome. And for people who are looking um, at your research and trying to see what's going to happen, what's next for you in the future? Yeah. So a lot of our research at the moment is looking at older adults who are undergoing uh, surgeries, elective surgeries, and seeing their cognitive outcomes, including dementia, and uh, this um, really fascinating condition called delirium, which unlike dementia, which is a chronic progressive cognitive impairment, delirium, we see people fluctuate even within the day from being quite impaired to, to unimpaired. So we're looking at what's happening in the brain um, that leads some people into this delirium episode. Wow, I think that's going to get quite a lot of interest in the future because that sounds fascinating. <laughs> But um, I have run out of time, unfortunately, and I have found so much of what you've said fascinating, especially as Lee quite succinctly said, it's not too late. There are things we can do. I can't wait to see where you go forward with your research and what kind of education you do. But otherwise, thank you so much, Hannah. We really appreciate you coming onto our program this afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks Hannah.